So uh, my name is Jeff Carr. I uh, wrote a book called Inside Cyber Warfare I, back in 2009 and came out. We wrote a second edition in 2011. Uh, I've uh, spent a lot of time helping uh, large companies figure out how to defeat attacks that were coming in from various groups and, and um, affiliated with nation states or independent actors. Uh, it's a fun, complex problem set. The, um, I'm no, I, I uh, am currently changing focus to work with uh, small businesses because they're the ones actually that are in uh, even worse shape. Uh, for, a small, for a big business, they get breached. You know, it's a problem, but it's not going to end their operation. But a small business, they get breached or they lose all their money in their, from their bank account, then that could be, that could be the end you know, of, their, of their business. So um, uh, I've decided to focus in an area where I think I can do more good, uh, which is with these small firms. Um, the big firms are, uh, <clears throat> there's really no saving them. They're, I mean, they're just, they're just in a constant state of breach. Whether they know it or not, regardless of how much money they spend, you can go to RSA and buy every single product on the floor, and they're still going to be breached. And the reason why is because while a tool or a product will, will, will intercept an attack or will drive the attacker into a minefield of virtual networks and honeypots and everything else, uh, it will not stop the attacker, right? So there's a distinction. If you think about it as a burglar, so if a, if, a, if a burglar is trying to break into a, into a house that has a lot of art, right, and they're going to try, they'll try the front door, it's locked. So you can consider that an attack, right, a defeated attack. Does that mean the burglar is going to stop? No. What happened was he now knows he cannot go through the front door. And that's what happens in the world of cybersecurity. A company will defeat an attacker in one way that he just educated the attacker about a method that will not work. So a determined attacker will simply go to the next step. And if it is, uh, if dependent on the value of the asset uh, and depending on the budget that the hacker has to work with, they'll just keep going until they're in. So that's why there is a a defensive paradigm that's known as assumption of breach. Um, it's been around for a long time. A friend of mine who is the CISO at University of Washington was one of the earliest uh, proponents of an assumption of breach framework, and that was back in the late 90s, Kirk Bailey. Uh, but yet even today, it is uh, sometimes a lot of folks will agree, yep, yep, it's inevitable, we're going to get breached, they'll agree, they'll, it's sort of, you know, they'll mentally, they'll say yes, but in their heart, they don't really believe it. Uh, they actually think that everybody else will get breached. It won't happen to them. So, um, so that's the world of, uh, that's the reality of, of, of uh, defending, of, of, an, of, of a defender who is attempting to protect their network, their assets uh, from an aggressor. When it gets, uh, when it, when it gets sticky, and even as we're seeing today, uh, dangerous, is when the a defender attempts to identify who the attacker is. So as long as they, um, you know, as long as they stick to non-state actors, who cares? It doesn't really matter. It's not going to change anything. It's not going to cause any harm. You can make up as many names as you like. APT 29, Fancy Bear, whatever you want to call it. Uh, they're all, these are all names associated with, basically, with a, a set of indicators of compromise that uh, they're not really people. You know, we like to think of them as people, but really, they're not. They're just uh, a set of common tools or a set of common techniques and procedures, and then they lump them together and they call it, they give it a name. And different cybersecurity threat intelligence companies will give it a different name. They'll give it their own name. Um, and then you find, find some that are particularly ambitious and they'll actually claim that their name is their intellectual property. 
So it just go, it goes into this you know uh, amazing Alice in Wonderland type of upside down universe where uh, we we really believe that we're able to identify uh, somebody on the other side of an attack. And uh, what I want to talk to you about today is when um, we start pinning the blame on other governments. That has real world consequences. Because, and we see it today with Russia. So Russia does enough bad shit where we, we don't have to invent things. In, invading Ukraine, shooting airliners out of the sky, uh, crushing their opposition, uh, crushing political opponents or their opposition in Commonwealth of Independent States. I mean, there's plenty of real world examples of why uh, you, know, you want to take action or some type of uh, Security Council or other economic action against uh, the, the government of Russia. But what we don't need to do is throw fuel on the fire and when, when a cybersecurity company, uh, for, for uh, marketing reasons, decides to say APT28 is Russian intelligence or is the GRU. Uh, which is one of Russia's intelligence services. They're uh, formerly known as military intelligence, uh, now, um, uh, now known under a different name. Uh, but the, but the, the, so today we're going to talk a little bit about what happens when states outsource their cyber intelligence, because that's what happens. Uh, uh, to give you a, a, little, a little framework, the, uh, you all are familiar with the DNC hack and what that led to during the course of the election season last year. So there were a bunch of incidents starting with the DNC hack. Um, CrowdStrike, well, very well known um, cyber intelligence and product company uh, uh, was contacted. They did the the forensics work on this, CrowdStrike, in fact, was the only organization that actually conducted forensics on the DNC servers. Nobody else, including the FBI, did that work. Everybody from, I don't care who, who it was, CIA, NSA, FBI, DHS, plus foreign agencies, None of them had their hands on the DNC server except CrowdStrike. The, and so the report CrowdStrike issued and the data that they shared was it. That was it. So, and CrowdStrike made the, the assessment that APT28 is the GRU, APT29 is the FSB. And to my knowledge, that was the first time that any, uh, anybody assigned a specific intelligence agency to a specific threat actor group. So once that hit the news, um, you know, things started just sort of snowballing from there. Because then what happened was the hack itself really was, could qualify simply if it was Russian intelligence would really only qualify as, es as an act of espionage. Espionage is legal. So we might not be happy about it, but there was really nothing that could be done. It, as an isolated act, it was legal. We do it, right? So it's not like the US government has never done this. Um, but however, what happened next was that files that were files from the DNC made their way to WikiLeaks. And then uh, Julian Assange, uh, who doesn't, is not a fan of Hillary Clinton, uh, uh, directed WikiLeaks to release these files at certain times where it would, it would hurt uh, Clinton's campaign. And by uh, extension, help Trump's campaign, right? So, if you, it, 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 if you still believe that the Russian government, uh, which we do, I mean, by, by we, I mean the U.S. government, 
uh, we're, we're now out of the legal act of espionage. We're, we're, we've crossed that boundary now, and we've moved into a, an improper action, which would be uh, attempting to influence a, an election in a, in a foreign country. Again, not that the U.S. has never done that, because regime change is like you know, our, one of our favorite things uh, to do. And obviously, any, any government around the world, a major government, is always interested in, in uh, having uh, a person who will be friendly with them at the helm of, of another government somewhere else in the world, right? Whether it's here in the U.S., South America, China, it doesn't matter. So, so we now have a theory that uh, the, the attack against the DNC uh, didn't stop there, that the Russian, Russian intelligence somehow uh, decided to move that data over to WikiLeaks, and then they ordered WikiLeaks to release it. And, and this was what the U.S. intelligence agency eventually charged the Russian government with. But it all comes down to this concept that APT28, one of these two groups, uh, was uh, uh, run by and is, is, in fact, actually the GRU. So what I'm going to show you today is a second report that CrowdStrike generated. And I'm, gonna pick, I'm picking on this report because it's, it, it's just, um, it stands head and shoulders above every other report that any cyber threat intelligence company has ever issued. Uh, and, 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 that, and you'll see what I mean by that. It's not a good thing. It's actually the most egregious uh, uh, piece of, 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 uh, of, of, in, of fabrication that I, that I have ever seen, that even that my peers have ever seen, the ones that will discuss it privately. Um, and, you, and you'll see what I mean in just a few minutes. So what we're going to do is start with that video. Now, uh, the video will be self-explanatory. It'll explain the value of this second report. And uh, let's try to get this back. The CIA and other U.S. intelligence agencies have concluded the Russian government was behind the email hack into the Democratic National Committee and other political organizations, but have yet to produce their evidence publicly. President-elect Trump has questioned that conclusion. Today, the private cybersecurity company that first uncovered the DNC hack unveiled new details that they claim confirmed the Russian military intelligence service was behind the computer breach. Here to explain all of this is Dmitry Alperovich. He's the co-founder of CrowdStrike, the company that did the investigating. And Thomas Ridd. He's a professor at King's College London. His latest book is Rise of the Machines, a cybernetic history. And we welcome both of you to the news hour. Dmitry Alperovich, let me start with you. What is this new information? Well, this is an interesting case that we've uncovered actually all the way in Ukraine, where Ukraine artillery men were targeted by the same hackers that we call Fancy Bear that target the DNC. But this time, they were targeting their cell phones to actually try to understand their location so that the Russian military and Russian artillery forces can actually target them in the open battle. So this is Russian military intelligence who got hold of information about uh, the weapons, in essence, that the Ukrainian military was using and was able to change it through what you, malware. Yes, essentially uh, one Ukrainian officer built this app for his Android phone that he gave out to his fellow officers to control the settings for the howitzer uh, artillery pieces that they were using. And the Russians, the Russians actually hacked that application, put their own malware in it, and that malware reported back the location of the person using the phone. And so what's the connection between that and what happened to the Democratic National Well, Committee? the interesting thing is that it was the same variant of the same malicious code that we had seen at the DNC. This was a phone version. What we saw at the DNC was for the personal computers, but essentially the same source used by this actor that we call Fancy Bear. And when you think about, well, who would be interested in targeting art Ukraine artillery men in eastern Ukraine, who has interest in hacking the Democratic Party, Russian uh, government comes to mind, but specifically Russian military that would have operational control over forces in Ukraine and would target these artillery so, so just quickly, in a sense, these are like cyber fingerprints? Is that what we're talking Essentially about? Essentially the DNA 
of this malicious code that matches to the DNA that we saw at the, D, uh, at the DNC. Thomas Ridd, to you in London, as you read about this, understand this new information, what do you make of it? How do you see it? Okay, so I'm actually, because we have time, I'm actually going to play, we'll play the whole thing. It's only seven, it's almost eight minutes, but really it's not that long. But, but I, think, I think it'll be valuable just to watch the whole interview. So um, I'm going to go ahead and let it play. Well, the important piece, I think, is that we're looking at uh, only one piece in a larger puzzle here. What CrowdStrike have discovered is one piece of a larger picture. And the picture is already rich. We know how they choose their targets. We know thousands of their targets, even by individual names. We know how they get in, how they move around, how they take information out. We know the infrastructure, a bit like the flight car that they use to take the information out. And I think we're approaching the point where the evidence, evidence is so rich that there are only two reasons not to accept it. One, because you don't understand the technical uh, details, because you, because you don't have the skills, or because you don't want to understand it for political reasons. Well, you do have the technical expertise. Does it, all, does it hold up for you? Um, yes. Uh, you know, as I, I, what I do is I look at specific cases, and I drill down, and I zoom into the detail of the picture and look at that detail. So we can often link specific cases like the one that Dimitri was just describing to another case because the set that they're using is the same. Really like the tool of a burglar breaks into one building and uses the same or a comparable tool in another building. So one thing that I'm, for instance, interested in and that I focused on is how they broke into the German parliament and that we can link that to the DNC. And indeed, we can also link those two cases. So the evidence is really strong that we have at this point. So the evidence is really strong. Are you saying there's just no doubt about it at this point? Among people who study digital forensic evidence, among people who do incident response, uh, the vast majority of this community, and you know, bear in mind, this is an entire profession trained to do digital investigations. Most people in that profession accept the evidence that we have. It's really not controversial anymore. <coughs> We're looking at a major Russian uh, campaign. You know, keep in mind, this has been going on for many years. This particular actor, we watched them for eight years. And over the past year, they made quite a lot of mistakes, which revealed themselves. Now, Dmitry Alperovich, we, we want to point out, and we said earlier, you were, your organization, your company was the one that uncovered this in the first place. You were working for the Democratic National Committee. Are you still working, doing work for them? Uh, we're protecting them going forward. The investigation is closed in terms of what happened there. But certainly, we've seen that campaigns, political organizations are continue to be targeted. And um, they continue to hire us and our, use our technology to protect themselves. I ask you that because if there's any question of a conflict of interest, how do you answer that? Well, this report was not about the DNC. This report was about the new investigation we've uncovered about what these Russian actors were doing in eastern Ukraine in terms of locating these artillery units of the Ukrainian army and then targeting them. So what we just did is said that it, it looks exactly the same to the evidence we've already recovered from the DNC linking the two together. So if there's still someone out there like the president-elect or others who support him who say, we just don't believe this, we don't think it's been proven, we haven't seen the CIA and the FBI's information, what's your response to that? Well, I think it's legitimate to ask questions, and this is why we wanted to produce more evidence that raises the level of confidence that we have even internally that this is Russian military intelligence agency called the GRU. I think it's also important for the government to release their own evidence, and I'm encouraged that President Obama ordered this review. I hope the report that comes out will be made public so that everyone can look at it and make their own judgments. Thomas Ridd, what more would you need to see? What more would a skeptic need to see in order to erase all doubt? Of course, we can always see more evidence and look for more details, for instance, on specific names of operators. And we know that you know, some intelligence agencies in the United States seem to have that information. But let's keep something in mind. What they want to achieve, what this Russian operation is trying to achieve at this point, is to drive a wedge between the president-elect, between the next administration, and the intelligence community. And so far, <coughs> see that as part of the operation. They've been spectacularly successful. So releasing more evidence and then having critics, possibly even the president-elect, say, well, that's not good enough. That is exactly the outcome that they want, because it introduces friction inside 
the security establishment in Washington. Just quickly, Dimitri, is that what you see as well? I, I, I think that it's important to bring all the evidence out. Some people legitimately have questions about this. It's important to, for the U.S. government to come out and tell us what they know, because certainly they have access to classified intelligence and sources and methods that we are not privy to as a private security company. So I think it is important to know what happened in this most consequential hack we've ever seen. And, of course, we have no way of knowing if that's what they will, <coughs> what they will do. But, of course, we will continue to watch this very closely, as will you, Dmitry Alperovich, Doc, Professor Thomas Ridd. We thank you both. Okay. So, so you just saw, you know, the PBS special, right? So pretty convincing, right? I mean, pretty much, right? You watch it and you think, all right, it, it all makes sense. So, uh, let's start. Let's take a look. Um, I want to. I, I, I let this entire thing play because you're you're at a college, and Tom Ridd is a well-known uh, professor uh, at uh, King's College in London, and. Uh, I am not. I'm not a professor. I don't have a PhD. Um, but what I would, what I would want from from my professor, uh, would be a requirement that uh, we look at both sides, right? That we weigh the evidence in an objective way, sort of like applying the scientific method, right? You try to you 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 have a theory, you test the theory, you see if it holds up. Uh, I've, in my opinion, uh, Professor Ridd did not uh, do that. I would, I, and I'm hopeful that, um, that that is not an example of what uh, prestigious universities do, um, that that would be the exception. Because this particular case turned out to be completely fabricated. And I'm going to show you why. Uh, at least I'm going to show you parts, parts of, of the reason why. So uh, the, this got a lot of press. And what CrowdStrike said in their report was that this particular app, which was developed by a artillery officer, had been compromised. It had been widely distributed. And over the course of several years of use, it resulted in an 80% loss rate of the 120 millimeter howitzer, which was what that particular Ukrainian officer's uh, uh, team uh, was, was manning, right? Uh, the D30, which is 120 millimeter howitzer. So, and this got international press coverage. So the Ministry of Ukraine said, they, they, they actually put out a press release saying, that's absolutely not correct. We never had those types of losses. The few losses that we have had had nothing to do with hacking. And it had everything to do with uh, 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 human intelligence, uh, which is Russian uh, sympathizers in eastern Ukraine who spy on the positions, the artillery positions, and then report back to the Russian military, who then attack those positions. Even with human intelligence, they did not suffer anything close to an 80% loss rate. So where did that come from? Well, it came from a, a pro-Russian blogger uh, that is known for exaggerating uh, field conditions in the Russia-Ukraine war. I mean. You know, it, it would be like reading uh, a, 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 a gossip sheet in Hollywood uh, about, you know, about famous actors. Well, they write about famous actors and they exaggerate it because that's what sells uh, newspapers. This blogger exaggerates Russian victories in Ukraine because that's what gets clicks on his blog. And, and for whatever reason, CrowdStrike decided, Sounds good to us, so we'll just run with the 80% figure because it, it supports you know, our theory, right? That's probably the least outrageous thing that happened on this report. Uh, Adam Myers, who co-authored this report with Dmitry Alpirovich, Adam Myers is a co-founder, just like Dmitry is. Uh, he happens to be in charge of CrowdStrike's 
intelligence division, I use the word intelligence lightly, um, was quoted uh, in, an, in an interview with The Telegraph as saying that uh, the software would have allowed attackers to monitor Ukrainian units' rough position on the battlefield in real time using GPS. The only problem is the malware didn't ask for GPS. There is nothing in the code that called for the position for, for GPS to provide a position. Zero. I mean, nothing. So it would be impossible for the malware to function the way that it was represented in this report. The only thing the malware did do was collect base station information. Well, base station information in eastern Ukraine could cover an, uh, easily a 20 square mile area. So even that, even if they were able to do that, that wouldn't be nearly specific enough to, to zero in on specific artillery positions. Uh, now, we know that the only reason why we know that the mal what the malware actually could not do was because I asked, <laughs> I asked a independent lab to collect the sample that CrowdStrike posted to VirusTotal. VirusTotal is uh, a, an organization, now it's a for-profit organization, uh, that is a sort of a resource for cybersecurity companies to submit their malware samples for peer review, so to speak, um, sharing threat information with other cybersecurity companies. You have to pay a lot of money to actually access this kind of information on VirusTotal. So I asked Crisis Lab, which is a Hungarian uh, uh, research laboratory that's part of the University of Budapest, to call down, to, to collect that malware sample and analyze it, and then post their findings. And that's how um, we were able to identify the fact that this particular piece of malware could not do what CrowdStrike said it did. Now, why would they say, right? Why would they say that it, it did that? I don't know. I've asked CrowdStrike, I, they won't tell me. We call malware, sometimes we refer to it as a cyber weapon um, or a cyber uh, munition. And, and, and this is an important point because when you, when you write a piece of malicious code and you send it out to a target, you've now lost control of that code. You've now shared it with your target, or you've shared it with whoever might be able to obtain it. Um, this flies in the face of the prevailing theory that CrowdStrike and many other companies operate under, which is that the code used by this particular threat actor group, APT28, has never been used by any other group in the 10 years that they have been, that, that, that APT28 has been on uh, uh, somebody's radar. So we, we, we call this exclusive, the theory of exclusive use. That somebody in, in Russian intelligence crafted this, it's, it's called X-Agent, crafted this X-Agent malware and somehow over the course of 10 years, it has never escaped. Uh, nobody else has obtained the source code. Therefore, whenever you see an attack and it has X agent or it has a variant of X agent, it is immediately pinned on the Russian government. Why? Exclusive use. There's, it, it doesn't matter that, there's no, that it's impossible to prove it. It's, it's, it's almost biblical. Actually, it's almost biblical in the sense that it's like saying, it's like, I don't know how many, of, and I don't mean to uh, offend anybody of a religious, certain religious persuasion, but if you ever observe a debate, a religious debate, right? Does God exist? Does, not, does God not exist? Did God write the Bible? Didn't he write the Bible? It's all, it's based on, you know, belief, right? It's based on faith because you can't really prove it. So it's based on faith. That's kind of what exclusive use is. It's like religious dogma. It's based on faith. No real evidence. The fact is, real munitions you can't reuse. 
You drop a bomb, the bomb explodes, end of bomb, right? You send out a piece of malware, you could send that out again, 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 again. The problem is that eventually you're going to send it to somebody who can reverse engineer it. Now, the, as it turns out, just recently, another cybersecurity company uh, called ESET, e -S -E -T, uh, published a report in, I think it was in October of last year, wherein it was a three-part report, very extensive, on X-Agent. And in that report, they said, we, we were able to discover the source code for X-Agent. Then, uh, in the course of my research on this, I talked to a Ukrainian, a Ukrainian hacker group. The leader of the group said, oh yeah, we have that source code too. So, we are, so it, it's clear that the whole, the entire basis, right, of blaming X agent on one intelligence agency, let alone the, the fact that there's no, there's no technical proof that it even was ever written by that agency, but we now know that exclusive use is a, is, is, is a myth. To, uh, I think it was yesterday, just to underscore this, uh, yesterday a re another researcher formerly employed by the NSA looked at the ex-agent code that was discovered by two more cybersecurity companies last week and said, oh, this looks, this is identical to code that was written by an Italian firm called the Hacking Team. And, and so what happened to, this is an open and shut case. It's the GRU. There's no doubt about it, right? If you don't accept this evidence, you've either got to be uh, uh, technically illiterate or you have to just refuse to see the big, the big truth, right? That, that's all bullshit now. <laughs> uh, it's not, we now know that, that this particular piece of malware was widely available. So that element, that component needs to be uh, taken off the table. Now, has anybody, has CrowdStrike issued a retraction on their claim that uh, 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 the GRU sabotaged a phone app, you know, and resulted in 80% casualties? Nope. Not a word. Not a word. Even after it was shown that the, app, that the malware could not do what CrowdStrike said it did, and even after the developer of the malware said that particular one was only in use that was version one. It was only in use for a few months in 2014. And after that, I stopped supporting it. So it couldn't possibly have continued to be in use over the course of the war. No retraction. And uh, yesterday, right, the 15th, uh, there's a blog post, the Council of Foreign Relations blog. This is, this is a, a weighty blog. People pay attention. Pe they pay attention to what the people from the Council on Foreign Relations have to say. Adam Siegel um, is a uh, well-known pundit in this field. He wrote, Chinese cybersecurity company reported APT-28, which the U.S. government has attributed to Russia's intelligence services was active in China in potential violation of a Russia-China cyber non-aggression pact. So this is, this is a, uh, uh, the outcome of a marketing tool. So CrowdStrike gained m probably millions of dollars in free publicity by doing the DNC hack and by announcing that it was a GRU and the FSB and running with that. Um, I, I can't even put a dollar number on it. I mean, really, it's, it's just, uh, it's incredible. And, and that triggered calls in Congress, right, to take action against Russia, uh, to, to inflate, to inflame what we already have. We already have a bad relationship with them to further inflame it based on a commercial for-profit companies report is outrageous to me. Now we're looking at a, 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 a well-known 
uh, uh, pundit at CFR raising, re repeating this <laughs> false claim that APT-28 represents the Russian intelligence and that now could trigger a problem between Russia and China because of some non-aggression pact. And, and you'll see this will continue. Uh, and it, this is happening because for some reason, lack of budget, lack of resources, lack of technical expertise, I'm not really sure. The FBI has been uh, suffering from a uh, inability to process cyber, their own cyber threat intelligence. So they, they in, I think it was in 2006, the agents didn't even have their own email address. They were sharing computers in 2000. That was that, 10 years ago, right? Um, they, they've been ramping up. I mean, the FBI is uh, now actively involved in creating a network of, of uh, nodes of collecting uh, co uh, collection boxes on corporate networks around the world that agree to cooperate with them uh, so that they can, they, they can gather more of their own intelligence, but they still rely heavily on private intelligence. Now, I, I know partly because I've sold intelligence to the FBI when I first started in this business in 2009, 2010. A lot of my income was generated through sharing intelligence, our own intelligence findings with the FBI, also with CIA, also with uh, the uh, Foreign Office in the UK, uh, with uh, uh, the Finnish um, military, and with uh, Czech intelligence. So I, I'm very familiar with how much money can be made providing cyber threat intelligence to other governments. Um, and I was a tiny company you know, doing this. Some of these companies are very large and make way a, a, a boatload of money. The problem is it's all conjecture. We're all guessing. When, I, when my company was providing what we could find through open sources to our government customers, we always did it with the stipulation that we cannot vet any of this. We have no idea how much of this is accurate. We're, we're, I, I was assuming, naively, that the information that I would share with an intelligence agency or with a law enforcement agency would be vetted, that they would be vetting it, right? But that's clearly not what's happening. Uh, and so we have built up since the late 90s a huge compendium of privately generated cyber threat intelligence, which is in databases, in government databases, uh, and they, it never gets corrected. It never gets vetted. So what'll happen is, like what just happened with the DNC, uh, a private firm will come in, they'll do the forensics, they'll say, oh, look at this. This has been attributed to so-and-so. Does it, could you pick the government, right? And the intelligence agencies will run with that. You know, it's, if, it, if, if it's possible that they have conflicting information, and it was certainly possible in this case that they did um, because of the amount of time it took before all of the agencies got behind this Russia attribution, um, that could mitigate the effect. Uh, for whatever reason, I, I personally, I think it was driven politically. The final assessment of placing the blame with Russia was, was not so much the technical side of the attack. It was the, um, the, the control, the presumed control of WikiLeaks and their release of damaging emails. So, um, so I, I, I think that somebody uh, in, in the classified world did, un, did see some of, the prob, some of the technical problems that existed with using just the malware to place the blame on the Russian government. And then therefore they looked at the overall um, uh, attempting to shape the outcome of an election. Uh, having said that, we're in a, a difficult position today even now knowing that APT, this one threat actor group, APT28's 
uh, is no long, can no longer be presumed to be uh, uh, the Russian government, uh, in, in seeing that adopted widely, that governments, uh, including the UK um, and Germany, are insisting, continue to insist, right, that um, their enemy is the Russian government. Now, why would they do that versus saying their enemy is some you know, small hacker group or even a for-profit hacker group? Um, the reason why is because in international law, uh, international law when it comes to cyber attacks only has to do with government against government. So if I'm the US and I suffer an, a, a, an attack against something that I deem to be my critical infrastructure, uh, I only have recourse against another government. If I wanna go after an individual then I need to do that through law enforcement channels. Uh, the FBI has to coordinate, and, and we do that. I mean, the FBI has been very successful in when they do cooperations uh, or cooperational investigations with foreign law enforcement, in whether that's in Russia or in Germany or in Spain, um, it, you know, it, it, it results in an arrest. But if, I, if I'm a government and I uh, want to blame another government, the, or I want to, to uh, show politically that I'm taking action, the only way that I can take action as a government is to, is to point the finger at another government. And so uh, that's why we're caught in this mess because the only information that the intelligence, if I'm President uh, Trump and I say, oh, we just, got, we just suffered this attack against the electric grid in so-and-so, um, and, we, and who, you know, who's responsible, I, then I'm gonna expect the NSA, the, F the CIA, and, and the FBI, and so on, to tell me who's responsible. Most likely, they're gonna to turn to the, to the data that, that CrowdStrike, that FireEye, that other Palo Alto and other companies uh, have been providing. And how reliable is that? As you can see with this, it is not reliable. And the reason why it's not reliable is because there is no blowback. If, if, you're, if I'm a company and I submit a report, I publish a report, and it turns out that report is wrong, nothing happens. But if I publish the report and, it's, and it is assigning attribution to another government, I get lots of publicity. If the government is China or Russia, chances are good I would get a New York Times article. Almost certainly I'd get a Washington Post headline. Um, uh, so that's worth a lot of money. So where do I? So as a as a for-profit company, I have a huge upside to place the blame on a foreign government, and I have zero downside because if I'm wrong, nobody's going to hold me accountable. Now, uh, we don't want that for our intelligence arm of the government, right? We want an intelligence service to do that. That's their job because if they make a mistake. They're, they'll have to answer to Congress and to the president, who's their customer. If uh, when, when we have a failure, like the, like the failure of saying that Iraq had WMDs, or the failure that we missed the, uh, the, the nuclear weapons test that India did in 1998, when you have that kind of a massive intelligence failure, there's an investigation. And then there is a commission, right? And then there are uh, 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 findings, and somebody pays the check on that. Uh, so that's where this type of a, an assessment belongs, right? That's, that is where you want your government to make its policy decisions based on intelligence from an agency, not from a for-profit company uh, that has only uh, uh, only everything to gain, right, by making these sorts of guesses as to which government is responsible. Now, the takeaway for y'all, what I hope you'll take away from this, uh, is to be skeptical uh, when you hear the news. Cyber attack from Russia. Huh. Cyber attack from China, right? Cyber attack from Israel, who, uh, Iran, whomever. 
it is impossible, it is impossible to differentiate an attack that might have been launched from a government from an attack that might have been launched from a team, especially because some of the commercial hacking teams, like for example, there is one in Russia that generated over a billion dollars in two years. They reinvest 40% into product development. That means they have their own lab, their own software engineers, right? Their own QA department. It would, you cannot differentiate their work from any other lab's work on pure technical analysis. It's impossible. So, uh, uh, if you see that this kind of thing is happening, please help me out because I'm one of the few voices uh, of skepticism on social media. Ask some questions. Ask for the proof. You know, ask for um, uh, any kind of independent review. Uh, you know, just and you don't have to be a cybersecurity expert. Just as a citizen. As a taxpayer, that's enough. Just say, where is the evidence that is supporting this assessment of attribution? And I, I think if enough people start to question this, then these, these really egregious reports, like this one was, uh, will stop. You know, will stop happening. Yeah? So Donald Trump says, somebody, some fat guy in Russia did this. Could be true. Yeah, well, you know, I don't know that he would weigh 400 pounds, but, but I know some 300 pound hackers that could do it. Um, but, but if you go to RSA, I'm sure you'll be able to see a few of them yes, walking it around. Could be true, it's true then, right? It could be, it's possible, it's unlikely, because uh, it's unlikely because it, it, it's hard for any one person to do any of these type, any of the, the, these scale attacks is rel relatively rare that one person is involved. But, um, you know, I think Donald Trump, Donald Trump really uh, is his own worst enemy, right? He cannot articulate anything. So even, and even when he has a good point, he's so, he's so outrageous that you don't even, you can't even accept the good point, you know, because he said it. Oh, no, no. So it could it's be. Not, it's not 100% false. Right? It's, that's correct. It could be. The fact is, is really we don't know. We don't know. And that's, where, that's what you should say. If you don't know, just say you don't know. Don't make, don't make it up. Don't guess. Yes? Do you think that these misattributions are due to incompetence or deliberately yeah. misattributed for political yeah. reasons? Yeah. I, I think it's a, it's a mixed bag. It's a mixed bag. So you... If it's coming, it's it typically attribution only comes out of the private sector. And it's always for marketing, it's always for marketing reasons. When, when Mandiant company that was acquired by, by FireEye, and it's already after seven o'clock, so I'll, I'll, I'll end it That's here. Right. Um, as long as you don't have to rush on. So Mandiant in 2010, 2010, Google was attacked presumably by, by Chinese hackers. Um, and, we play, and, and Mandian blamed that on the Chinese government. So th there's a history, there's a history of blaming things on China that predates blaming things on Russia. So back, for, back in the 90s, uh, in the Air Force, a lot of Mandian's founders came out of the Air Force. The Air Force uh, was fielding a lot of attacks, right? And chances are excellent that it was uh, uh, coming from China. I'm not saying that, that, it, that China doesn't do it. Clearly, they do do it. Um, but they're not the only ones to do it. That's the problem. So, but, so back in the 90s, though, every attack, every single attack that people found was blamed on China. And then in 2010, Google announced that it had been breached. Some of its Gmail accounts had been breached. Not only Google, but I think like 20 other companies. It was pretty big. Um, Google pulled out of China for a short time as a, a gesture, right, of saying uh, they're upset. And Mandiant published their first white paper called APT1. So you can still find it online, APT1. It contained a lot of data. Some of it was years old. Some of it uh, um, 
There's a, a rumor that some of it was passed to them by the FBI uh, just to help get it out there. For whatever reason, in 2010, China was in Washington inside the Beltway. China was the bad guy. And, uh, and at our, you go to RSA, you go to other talks from 2010 till probably 2012, 2013 even, it was China, 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 right? Um, then uh, the New York Times had a breach. I think this was in 2013. Who'd they call? Mandiant. So Mandiant got major headlines. Uh, uh, again, blamed it on China, because for Mandiant, every, it was always China. And, uh, and, and FireEye got huge amounts of publicity. And then in the fall of 2013, Fire, uh, Amandian was acquired by FireEye for a billion dollars, which was about seven times their value, which was pretty good. Pretty good for a cybersecurity company. That was pretty good. But what do you think about North Korea and Sony? That was the government attributing it, wasn't it? So, the, so the, the ruling on North Korea and Sony was that North Korea was held responsible for the attack, but nobody is claiming that North Korean soldiers conducted the attack. Even, even um, FireEye, who did the DFIR at Sony, said that uh, um, it could have been South Korean leftists that did the attack. Uh, they really didn't know. But you see, the, the, when it comes to government against government, it's not, it doesn't matter if the government actually, if a government employee did the attack. What matters is, did the government control or direct the attack? So they could have farmed it out. They could have you know, hired contractors, whoever. But as long as you could show that they controlled it. And supposedly, the NSA had evidence that some direction was coming from the North Korean government. So the US government formally charged the North Korean government with that and, and issued a sanction against them. But the evidence was never public, right? No. Supposed to be, I, I guess it was classified in that case. Stepping away from current events just a little bit, uh, in your book, you write at length about how the Russian government has used a kind of triad of organized crime, uh, youth groups, Russian youth groups, right. and just miscellaneous commercial hackers to sometimes conduct their dirty business. Right. Is that still their MO, or has that evolved? And uh, specifically, has the FSB and the GRU taken on some of those roles that used to be kind of farmed out to yeah. these, these third parties? Well, you know, that's, um, that's a great question. It was, when I wrote that, it was from uh, the information in, in my book, mostly about Russia. Start, part of it was written in 2009. And that was a result of research done in 2008. Uh, and, and that research involved things that occurred even before then. So that was certainly true at that time. Uh, Russia has invested lots of money in cybersecurity and in both offense and defense. So today, it's much different than that. Um, every, uh, the military, the intelligence agencies, the police, they all have sophisticated technical tools, you know, to do whatever needs to be done. Um, so will the, are they still cooperating with, you know, in, independent hackers? Uh, I think so. I was told, I have a friend, uh, I should say really an acquaintance that I've known for many years who is Russian, uh, who is a hacker, a Russian hacker, although he um, uh, has family in uh, Ukraine. So he's been hacking the Russian government. Um, to support Ukraine, uh, Ukraine the, the Ukrainian effort. And he told me that, yes, the, uh, that the FSB still will uh, recruit hackers or blackmail hackers, you know, to work for them. Um, uh, I, I guess, you know, as far as organized crime and the other things, if, I suppose if it serves a purpose, sure, why not? You know, but the, it's, all, it's all speculation, really. Uh, at this point. There's no reason, technologically speaking, there's no reason for Russia to have to do that anymore. There's, they've spent enough money there. 
schools, Russian universities are uh, among the best in the world when it comes to science, computer science. Uh, Russian coders are, are uh, outstanding, do outstanding work, you know. So, uh, and that, that's why when you see some of these reports that come out, like, like, like this one, uh, not this one, but the one that came out about the DNC attack, uh, you have a, you, you know, they're claiming that a Russian intelligence agency used Russian servers, uh, a Russian uh, company, Yandex, for, for the email accounts, and another Russian company uh, for VPN service to launch attacks. So, so that doesn't make any sense to me. If you're an intelligence service, that's not what the NSA does. That's not what any intelligence service that I've ever heard of does. You don't, your, your job is to operate in secret, right? So if the NSA, when the NSA, uh, what we've learned since post Snowden is that the NSA will compromise a server somewhere else in the world and then uh, use that as a launch platform for the, whatever attacks that they intend to launch against whoever the victim happens to be. They don't do it from some server in Maryland or at Fort Meade. You know, that's, who's gonna, who does that? But for whatever reason, we believe that, that the Russian government is, is so incompetent that they would actually leave all of those clues. Um, so so uh, uh, what, what we know now is that really, based on our, our cybersecurity industry reporting, it, it's possible that any hacker, uh, with a little bit of research, could make their attacks look like whomever they want. Uh, we publish an awful lot of stuff about what we believe other actors are doing. And malware is widely available for sale in underground forums. Uh, so it's really, uh, the thing that worries me, uh, and I think now more legitimately than ever, uh, is that a, some unknown third party could start World War III uh, between two governments that have, that we're not doing what we have been led to believe they did. In this case, it was just an attack against an election, uh, uh, you know, the DNC. But imagine if that had been an attack using APT malware, APT28 malware, which we now know is widely available. But back then, we still had this theory, this illusion, this, you know, uh, exclusive use myth right? Imagine if that had not been against just some election, the DNC, election organization, but against uh, a grid, uh, the power grid, you know, that, they, that the power grid in Washington, D.C., or the transportation system in Washington, D.C. was interrupted. Uh, not just interrupted one time, but interrupted consecutive times, because that's certainly possible, you know, to do. Um, that would qualify for use of force response. An attack against critical infrastructure, especially if it's going to potentially cause harm or actually cause harm for, for our population, you'd be justified in, in responding with a military uh, level response, right? And, and that would have been against a government that had absolutely nothing to do with it. But they would respond. Uh, because they've just been attacked. And so now you're in, you know, a state of war. All because um, we have reached the point where any third party can make their attacks look like any government they want to. And in fact, uh, somebody just wrote a paper on this. Uh, uh, Sam, I'll send you the link and then you can share it. Sure. Um, I, I can't think of the name of the organization, but it just came out today. An excellent paper on how easy it would be uh, to, sh to mask uh, the identity or to create a, a false flag blaming an attack on another government because of these assumptions that we've held for so many years. Yep. Another question. Um, stepping away from all of the, the big name uh, players in cyber warfare and intelligence warfare, um, what are the up-and-coming countries that are rapidly developing cyber warfare capabilities? Uh, Iran gets a lot of press, North Korea, some too, but 
what are some of the other countries that are developing this capability um, for offensive purposes? So uh, every every developed country has has that capability or is developing the capability, right? So I would when I, I wrote. When I wrote the second edition of the book in 2011, I think I identified about 30 countries. But, um, but that was in 2011. So today, you know, it's certainly more than that. If, if, it's a develop, if it's a developing country, no. I mean, they have a more pressing concerns. You know, water, power, you know, um, a basic industry. Uh, but uh, every military now that's being that's going out into the field is fighting a network uh, networked war. So uh, having and part of that is having to defend the network, uh, having to ensure that the, that the network will uh, is resilient and not going to go down in the middle of uh, of, of a battle. Um, and uh, uh, in terms of Munitions, eventually, I think we're going to see cyber munitions uh, uh, sold in a marketplace just like uh, we sell everything else. Missiles, tanks, um, you know, uh, 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 other, uh, the ver 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 vast array of, of uh, ways to blow things up uh, will we'll include, because all of those companies that do that, all of the defense contractors that do that, are all working on offensive cyber uh, capabilities. Um, of course, those are all highly regulated. You know, you, you have to have permission to sell them uh, to another government. And, um, uh, but I, I, I'm confident that eventually we're going to see international exhibitions, defense exhibitions that are going to have their one area set aside for network warfare. Just, just a matter of time on that. So it, I have to unfortunately catch uh, a, a ride to the airport, okay. uh, but um, thank you very much, Sam. Yeah. Uh, you know for the opportunity, and I'll I'll send you. A, there's actually a couple of links I'll send you, and then you can uh, distribute, you know them, uh, accordingly. Thank you. Thank you.